Welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. And final week of our very special series entitled Understanding the Cultural and Ethnic Diversity of the Spokane Area People. On our previous programs, we've been talking about a number of issues dealing with public policy and human rights groups and victims. Today, we're going to talk with citizens from throughout Spokane County on the topic, Spokane People Making a Difference. Those individuals will speak with us about their concerns and what they think needs to be done, not only in the Spokane area, but throughout this country. I'm happy to have on the program to make this happen two members of the panel. First of all is Idaho State Senator Mary Lou Reed, who will be joining with former Idaho State Representative Jeannie Givens to question our good citizens. I also want to thank Jeannie Givens once again for serving through an internship with Whitworth College to make this production possible. At this time, I will turn the program over to former State Representative Jeannie Givens. Thank you, Tony. Welcome to the program. We're glad you're taking the time to be with us today to talk about this very important issue. You saw government officials, you saw a member of the city council, you saw a representative from the governor's office. Do you, are you satisfied with where they have put human rights on the agenda? Do you think they're doing enough or do you think they have blinders on? Anybody? John. Um, there are two types of leaders out there. Uh, there's the leader that is out there running the race and is at the head of the pack, and then there's the other one that looks more like a uh, pace car at the beginning of the race and is out there during the entire race and holding everybody back. And I think that uh, uh, maybe those people that are acting as pace cars and pacing the level of correction of this serious problem should move out of the way and let the rest of the people go. <laughs> That's interesting. Anybody else with a comment about what government is doing about human rights? Nancy. Martin Luther King told us that we should do what is morally right, not necessarily what is politically expedient. And I think that the, the, the bottom line in Spokane has routinely to do what is politic and expedient so as not to, to look in the mirror and say what is happening really in our community. Our political leaders are not willing to, to have the courage at this point to step out in front. And I agree with John, let's get some who are. What are you going to do about that? Well, in all honesty, my experience has been that in, in the recent past with the various incidents we faced as, as a member of the Interstate Task Force for Human Relations, in every situation, when, whether we had the, uh, the Klan costume at the Chevrolet dealer, whether we had cross burnings, it was the task force that had to go as a prod to its elected officials and say, you have got to say something. Not once in each of these instances has any elected official, whether city or county, taken the initiative and the courage to stand up in front of the entire community and say, not here. Hmm. All right, thank you. Mary Lou. Thank you, Jeannie. I think I want to pick up on that question, too, because I'm sure some people on this side of the room would like to comment on how they feel that the leadership, the political leadership in the Spokane area is dealing with the whole issue of, of racism. Bernie, can I ask you to stand up and comment on the leadership? Oh, certainly. I have many, many comments on this. I'll restrain myself, however. Um, one of the problems that I saw as I listened to the state or the government officials speaking about this issue was they spoke of laws on the books that were not being enforced. They spoke of a number of things that I had, as I thought about it, I thought, I don't know about these things. I wish we had something, someone like an ombudsman, that we could call, that we could contact, who would say, this is where you check, this is where you put the pressure on. Because we don't really have a central, a central focus where we can, we can focus in and say, Ah, this is a person who will tell us where we can go for some of these answers. Because ignorance is not freedom. The more you know, the stronger you are. Do you feel that there is a lot of covert uh, discrimination taking place in uh, existing in the Spokane area? Bernie, do you want to say something more about that, or is there someone else? Well, I, this is another problem as I see it, in that, first of all, 
I think very often we do not realize that we are discriminating. Now, that, that you might say, well, that's ridiculous. How could you not know you're discriminating? But sometimes when you're patronizing and this and that, you really are not, nobody has slapped you upside the head and said, you know, that is a terrible thing that you're doing. Uh, it, it, it becomes very ingrained, such as the word, uh, can I do you out of it? This is so much of a, a, a part of our vocabulary that we do not stop and think, hey, is this insulting to someone? Buck naked, squaw. These are all terms we don't, nobody has said, whoa, now listen here. A lot, lot of misuse of language and, and thoughtless use of language. Bill, do you want to respond to uh, what uh, Bernie said? I guess in response to your question um, with regards to do we have a problem with institutional or other uh, forms of racism or bigotry, I think we all have to accept that, uh, that there is indeed a problem in Spokane. I, I'm one of those rare creatures who was actually born and raised here. And, and a I, native. And, and, I, and I, I don't think it's changed except it's evolved. The manner in which it, it, it um, presents itself has changed. And, and we're all, we all have to recognize that we're part of that problem unless we, we join hands with others to begin to, to solve that. I, I think sometimes, however, that we can be, um, we can fool ourselves. And, and I think one of our panelists earlier on um, um, related um, um, a point that was important, and that is that we tend, when we get frustrated, to point the finger in another direction. We should turn that thing around at ourselves and, and recognize that we are, in fact, part of the problem. The, the politicians, as we criticize them, must, we must recognize that they are a reflection of the voters' will, the conglomerate, and we have to, we have to take responsibility then for our own actions. Th actually, uh, thank you. As a politician, I have to reinforce that. Yes, people, people or politicians do respond very definitely to their constituents. We've got another one, Rod. Well, I'd like to respond to, to, to what uh, Nancy said about, about politicians. And I, I agree with her that we should go down as a, as, as a group and, and let people know how we feel. But I think we should also, from watching the first show where we had the two people from government, when you ask a specific question and you, know, you want a specific answer and you hear the answer and the question is lost somewhere, ask the question again. You know, say, you know, I, don't want, you know I don't want to hear a speech. This is the question and I want, this is the, I want an answer for it. Also, I think that I would like to see politics, as we know it in this country, totally change. And it may sound silly to people, but we have you know, two parties, and, and those are the choices. I, I'd like to see it if, if you have two people to choose from, and neither one are acceptable, you should have a category to vote not acceptable, you get rid of those two people, and give me two more. You know? None of the above. <laughs> Jeannie, I'll toss it back to you. All right, thank you, Mary Lou. This is your home. This is your community. And throughout these programs, we've learned that your community is changing. Why do you think hate groups are attracted to the Spokane area? Jerry? I think I can easily, easily come to you on that. But number one, it's because we ignore them. We ignore each other. Um, Richard Wright's book, The Invisible Man, with a man who's running down in a sewer, running light bulb after light bulb so he can see himself and prove that he is there. Unfortunately, minorities do not exist in Spokane. Ask the larger community and they'll tell you so. Well, we've heard of them, we've never seen them. Mm -hmm. The Indian, the Native American in Spokane is the derelict down on Main Street. He is not the, re the larger community. The black in Spokane is either a preacher or he's non-existent. As far as I've been able to see, our children are coming up in the same environment and they don't know who they are. From that, we have our problems. And you think maybe the children are feeling invisible? They're very invisible. Mm -hmm. If when I was 12 years old, I know how crazy I went. I'm not the child of a mixed marriage. And if I am Indian and black, who am I? If I am white and black, who am I? That identity problem is going to pay off in about another five years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. What's happening to our community? Why are people from hate groups attracted to the Spokane area? Right. Well, I think it's very true that there are a lot of people who live in Spokane who have come from other places. I think a lot of people move out of cities so they won't have to address this is issue. They, they don't want to have to be politically active. They don't want their children to run into ethnic minorities. They don't want to have to deal with the drug issue. So they come here because it is a safe haven and then the problem doesn't exist because they are so uh, convinced that they've moved somewhere where it isn't going to exist. Mm, very interesting. 
Mary Lou, you want to take it away? Do you agree that it's a safe haven? Anybody want to react to what Roy has said? Are people moving into the Spokane area because they feel that there is not as many, there are not as many problems with, uh, with racism and, and uh, not as much crime, et cetera? Uh, what is the attraction? Yes. Bill. I guess I want to answer the last part, but the first part, I think we're, we're sitting in Spokane on a, um, if we accept the fact that there's a problem and that, uh, that racism or bigotry is just under the covers, we're, we're at a point where, in response to your question as to whether uh, we're safe, uh, the answer is clearly no. Uh, we are now presented as a community with the issue as it relates to gangs, drugs. I would suggest to you that given, given the, the legislative, um, the community response to how they're going to respond to this, we're going to find those covers pulled off immediately and see some very ugly things that, uh, that we have wanted to ignore for some time pop their heads up. They've always been there. It's not going to change. It's simply going to change the way, that, again, that they're presented. Yeah, I think we've got a serious problem, and uh, we're going to see it real soon. Well, of course, it's a series. There certainly has been a question as to whether or not law enforcement is dealing adequately with the problems that are here in Spokane. Anybody want to comment on uh, whether or not you feel law enforcement in Spokane is actually addressing the problem? Yes, Carolyn, would you stand up? I would. My son became involved in this so-called skinhead movement some time back. I made quite a few attempts going to the courthouse, talking to two different judges, talking to different police officers about the situation. I was told repeatedly it did not exist, that my son and his friends were merely trying to look di different from the other kids. And it went on and on, and I kept trying to get my son some mental help, and I couldn't get him in anywhere till it kept building and building until now he's sitting in a juvenile facility 300 miles away from home wondering really what happened and I know it's a lot to go into but my point is I took the time to call the police officers I took the time to talk to two separate judges about this and it was like oh just another mom was the way I felt so I felt okay maybe it is me and now look where my son is. So you sought help from law enforcement, and you, did, you feel you didn't get it. Anybody else no. have some comments on, on what's going on in Spokane right now in terms of, of uh, what the police are doing? Do you think they have adequate training? Uh, and have you felt over the course of this series that uh, enough has been said uh, about uh, the needs of Spokane for increased uh, understanding among the police force? Anybody? Anybody over there? All right. Yes. Peter. Well, I'm often confused with the skinhead movement, and I <laughs> truly resent that. Uh, my feeling is if, if leadership represents the ongoing programming and what's being activated within the Spokane area, and when leadership can come before this panel and this group of people and say that nothing of consequence has come before the city council agenda in two years, then I think there's something seriously wrong. Either they have failed to notice what's going on and did so in fact reflect that when they said they were too busy with the daily workings of the city to be aware of the abuses of discrimination, racism, and sexism. Then my question would be, how do we motivate them because it stops there and it should start to filter down through the police and through the other organizations so that they can be adequately trained, they can be educated, in order to effect change. They need to understand before they can do anything. And I don't think they have the understanding, but I also think it's not primarily through you know, the, their own fault. Peter, remember the city councilman said that we pay, we pay attention to the issues that are at the forefront. It was almost as though the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Do you think the human rights group, groups have done enough to capture the attention of city government? Well. I think they've made a start. I think there's a long ways to go, but it's part of a process. And I don't think, especially within this very wide area of, of human involvement, that you're going to see um, quick gains or a lot of changes that are going to be immediate. I would say, however, that when the city council says that they have not um, noticed this, possibly if they would actually listen to the people and not chit chat among themselves when someone's giving a testimony, someone might hear what's being said from the people in the grassroots movement. Thank you, Peter, you heard it here. <laughs> One question, let's move on to a different subject. What do you think is the best way to fight bigotry and racism right here in your community? David? I think education, um, uh, needs to be addressed more. Um, 
my children in school sometimes are faced with with a little bigotry and and uh, uh, we're one of the few Native American families and in, in fact in the area that I live in we're one of the few minority families um, I, I live in a little community north of Spokane and I I uh, I have to kind of look at not so much the the people impacting their philosophies so much on whether you're a different color or not I think I think sometimes that comes out and it's real evident when when people are just blatant about them themselves being prejudiced but I think uh, when a community is exercising a belief and that that community is uh, is is established in a pristine area or uh, the the local policies and government in that local community at the community centers at the voting halls at the you know all the little places where you get your luncheons and and every where the people are working working together um, I think sometimes they express themselves as being the majority in that area and it overlaps people that come into the area that happen to be of a different color or happen to be of a different faith mm -hmm. if it happens to be religious and so they're they're automatically put in a situation that's a little awkward because they're yeah, they could be an Anglo person or or some other person of other other color other than black or or Native American, and they would still feel the awkwardness. Um, so I think education and and all the levels mm -hmm. that that we have, even in local government, uh, uh, being trained in pluralism, I think is a big issue that that maybe we should all all look at a little closer. Okay, David, thank you. Quickly, Liz, do you agree education would be the solution to the bigotry and racism problem in Spokane? I don't know if it's the solution, but I think it's a good beginning. And I think we need to start at the top with the city council and, and work down. Um, and I don't, we need to educate ourselves and our friends and our families and our neighbors and our coworkers. I think it's a big issue. I think the other thing that we need to remember is that everyone has a value as a human being, and we ought to treat each other that way. Great words. Thank you, Liz. Mary Lou. Well, we haven't really talked a great deal about economy, but certainly that is an underlying theme. How do you feel about the availability of jobs for minority youth, youth and uh, whether or not that is actually an undercurrent that uh, job discrimination, job availability, that the city council and the human rights groups could all address in addition? Anybody want to talk about uh, jobs and uh, the whole economic issue? Got any, got any takers for, for the economy? You bet. Harold Blake. Uh, the, the, the one insight that, as a creative person, that I have or don't have is that it was, it's been discussed here quite you know, through the whole program that uh, part of the problem centers around the fact that most people are turned off by the differences in things. And keeping in mind it's the creative mind that rejoices in the difference in things. And I, I don't advocate giving everybody art education, but... It's, Although it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it's someplace in that process, and, and the creative mind is drawn to that which is different. It starts its action there. The, the other insight has to do with... Uh, uh, well, it's too long, but I, I think we can get into art as process one of the things, that as soon as we start art education in schools, we deal with art as object or performance, or, but not as process. And I think some of the value of the things I've done with workshops is that the kids involved suddenly realize they have nothing to fear by venturing into the unknown. And I think that can be broadened in many ways that I don't know about. And if any of you here I think you could use a mind like me in your programs, I'd sure like to be involved. But you're, you're, you're thinking, actually, that art is a way in which celebration of differences can take, yeah. uh, take yeah. place because it's saying, let's take risks, let's, let's open doors, let's look forward and outward rather than... Uh, uh, the status quo, is that right? Traditionally, that's where the arts have been, yeah. 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 At the edges of things. At the edge, at the cutting edge. And, and Jeannie, Jerry, Harvey, really. Back to your question about employment. Jerry, why don't you respond to that, about the employment situation for minorities in Spokane? Well, I think there's a problem that extends beyond just minorities. That if you notice, most of our youngsters here have already developed an attitude that says, they're not going to hire me anyway. There isn't a job there. And the majority of the jobs that they're looking for, they're in competition with BAs and MAs that want to stay in the area, but they still have to bust tables because they can't get up to a waiter's position. Those are the jobs that are basically available for kids in this community. In a city of some 200,000 people, 
we're still operating as though we're a little town that has a corner drugstore and five kids that share the job. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. A minority kid, because of his identity, sees a group of white kids working in a restaurant, will not ask about a job because he's not going to get hired. That's his opinion. He makes that decision. He doesn't even ask. His mindset is a result of his education. This community teaches him he has no worth. And what do we do to counter that uh, negative, negative uh, self-image problem? Okay. There's a question about education. <coughs> I'm very interested in watching my school district where I work as they deal with uh, uh, that nice cultural image. And I'm trying to remember what they call it. They call it equity. One of the things I understand about equity is that eventually it becomes neutral. It doesn't teach Malcolm X. It teaches only Martin Luther King. It doesn't teach freedom, justice, and equality. It teaches nonviolence. Mm. Okay? So out of everybody's background, it takes all the controversy and leaves white bread. <laughs> you know what happens when you have a steady diet of white bread? <laughs> Lou. Yes. Marcia, would you like to say something about how you feel the media is addressing uh, these particular issues? I know that you have some ideas of your own on the media's responsibility. Well, from what I've seen, um, I feel like that when a situation, an incident is incorrectly, um, inadequately reported on, it makes us all victims in that any progress that's being made is stopped because we need the truth to uh, make progress. I think knowledge and truth have been certainly central to the discussion in these last programs. Jeannie. Mary Lou, bouncing off of that subject of the, uh, the news, the media, uh, have you been satisfied with the coverage of the events, the television coverage, the newspaper coverage on the uh, incidents of harassment? Do you think that the media has treated this subject fairly? Have they sensationalized it? Anybody care to respond? John. Definitely would. Uh, the, the media has not picked up on the fact that there are minority doctors, lawyers, uh, businessmen in our community. They tend to point toward, at least with the Indian community, the few Indians that are hanging around downtown on Main Street so that they can paint a picture that they believe is true. They need to change that image. They need to uh, focus in on the true Indian community here in our town, in the true black community as well as the Hispanic community. Um, there's a good friend of mine who is a professor out at the Gonzaga University, and he was interviewed by the newspaper for two hours while they gathered information where he talked about uh, all of the successful people in our community here, they never used a drop of that. What they used was the uh, Indians uh, on the reservation who are starving and uh, drive their cars uh, till the wheels falls off, and you know, to paint that picture that they strongly believe in their mind, and that has to change. Don't you think Hollywood has reinforced that, that image? Definitely has, <laughs> definitely. All right, another quick uh, question on the media. Do you think the media, the television, the newspapers have done an adequate job of, of covering human rights issues? Nancy. No, I think the media is playing a game, and I think they've got so wrapped up in their game that they've lost their professional ethics as members of the community as opposed to members of their profession. There, there's a fine line there. And part of the game is to, to make more money and to get more notice. And if that means sensationalizing something, whether it's playing up the skinhead situation or failing to deal with the, the impact and the consequences of things like cross burnings, that's what's going to happen. We, don't, we get superficial, deleted word, and we do not get substance. It's not happening. And uh, as we, we look at television news, we're not getting any content there either. They don't have the time for it. So where is the time? The newspaper? What's in it for the newspaper? What kind of commitment do they have? So when we talk about training our politicians and our city employees and our county employees, let's start training all of the people who work for the media right along with them. Because if they don't understand it, it's not going to get translated back out. 
it doesn't matter how much the, the human rights groups talk. If we can't get it out through the media, we've got a problem. Jeannie, we have three minutes left. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Lou? I thought you were going to ask Nancy to perhaps oh. do a little concluding there. Well, Nancy, yes. Uh, Nancy has been with our, with our program for the, uh, for the full uh, for the full four programs, and she's been a critical, important person in helping organize this, and she is responsible for gathering all of you here. I would like for you to just think for a little bit, Nancy, and do a summary for the whole group of your reaction to these programs. Back up again. What a diverse group to summarize for. First of all, I think we're dealing with a, a, a culture of a white dominated society that believes in its heart of hearts that if you're not one up, you're one down. And if we're going to stay one up, that means somebody else has to be one down. And we've been talking about the people who've been selected for that role. We've got to get past that. And this community in Spokane has got to have the courage to look in the mirror, as Bill Dillon was saying, and admit that we are diseased and we've got to start finding the medicine to effect the cure. So long as we slap superficial band-aids on it, nothing's going to change. The disease continues to grow. And that's going to take courage, not just on the politician's part, but on everyone's part. I think we're also expressing a need for all of the human rights organizations, as well as all other organizations in the community, to build a coalition, and maybe around the Northwest Coalition Against Malicious Harassment, that, that has been uh, organized. But we have got to become allies for each other, and it's not just going to have to be the minority organizations that pull it off. It's got to be all of us together. With that, I have to bring the program to conclusion. I want to thank Jeannie Givens and Mary Lou Reed and all you in the audience and those who have been guests the previous three weeks. And I agree and echo Nancy's comments that we have learned much and we have much to do yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed this four-week program, and most of all, I hope you are willing to commit yourself to this issue. And we've been talking about understanding the cultural and ethnic diversity of the Spokane area people. Next week, we'll be moving on to another issue. I hope you will join us. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.